So now we have Rior Machinia from Akita University, who is going to be speaking about a quantitative approach to the primitive words conjecture. Okay, uh, thank you, Noam, for the introduction. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. My voice clear? Okay, okay. So, uh, hi, this is Ryoma from Akita University, Japan. Uh, I want to say thank you to all organizers, and uh, I suppose that making our timetable of this workshop is not easy because the, the time zone of all participants are quite wide from Texas to Japan, uh, but they made a perfect timetable, at least for me. Thank you. Okay, so, so this talk is divided into mainly three parts. And the first part is a lot of survey talk. And uh, I first introduce what the notion of the primitivity and the uh, primitive words conjecture is. Okay. So in this talk, we call our non empty word W as primitive. If it cannot be represented by a power of any proper shorter words. Okay. So here after we only consider the case the, that the alphabet consists of only two letters, A and B, and actually this is enough for solving general conjecture, okay? And uh, we simply write QA as Q, okay? So Q denotes the set of all primitive words over a binary alphabet A, okay? So for example, consider word A, B, A, B, A, so this cannot be represented by a uh, power of any shorter words. So this is a primitive word. It is in Q. But if we add the letter B from light, then we obtain the word A, B, A, B, A, B, which is a cube of A, B. Three repetition of shorter words A, B. So it is not primitive. So the conjecture is very simple. Q is not context free. And this is a uh, still open since the 1991. So this conjecture is uh, soon to be 30 years old, which is originally posed by Domoshi and Hobas and Ito Sensei. So first, I explain some reason why the primitivity is important. Okay, so primitive words are like prime numbers in natural numbers. So because we have some uh, unique factorization theorem for words by using primitive words, every non-empty word W can be uniquely represented by a power of primitive words. Okay, so this gives a good decomposition of the set of all words over A denoted by A star, okay? The any word can be represented uniquely as a the power of primitive words, okay? So Q gives us a good decomposition for the set of all words, like prime numbers. And uh, there is a several different characterization of primitivity. One can define the primitivity by using the notion conjugation. So consider the word W of the form UV and we denote uh, by U inverse WU the conjugate of original word W by U. Here U inverse represents the removing prefix U from W and uh, adding U as a suffix, okay? And we obtain our word VU, which is a conjugate of original word UV, okay? And if U and V are non-empty word, then the this conjugate is called a proper conjugate. And here is uh, another characterization of primitivity. W is primitive if and only if W is not equal to every proper conjugate of itself, okay? So if, if we think about, uh, if we think the conjugation as a partial morphism is on words and then the primitivity just means there is no non-trivial automorphism. So primitivity has, primitivity has some similar flavor with the notion called the rigidity. 
which is uh, important in uh, model theory and uh, finite model theory too. Okay. So because the primitive was gives a uh, good decomposition theorem, so it plays a central role in algebraic coding theory and the combinatorics on words too. And also there is a, some special subclass of primitive words called the Lindon words, and which is uh, useful in useful in text compression. Okay. So this is a very last reason why the primitivity is uh, matter. Okay, so here is the picture of two guys. The left one is uh, Ito Sensei, and the right one is the middle one is uh, Hori Sensei. And they recently published the monograph, at which consists of numerous results of primitive words and context free languages. Okay, so this talk I sometimes refer this monograph. And actually, the, the, my title is title page is inspired by this book. Yeah, I mimic it. Okay. So here is a third guy, Shirad Fazekas from Akita University. And his supervisor was a party at the University of Debrecen, Hungary. And he also studied with Masami Ito uh, as a postdoc researcher in Kyoto Sangyu University. And his main topic, his Main research topic is combinatorics on words and formal languages, and he is familiar with primitive words conjecture too. So I moved to Akita University three years ago. Since then, I sometimes discussed with uh, Silas Sensei about combinatorics on words and primitive words. And then I have been interested in this conjecture and then start to uh, survey and study it. So here is brief history. So now let me explain uh, some a brief survey of known approaches to the primitive world conjecture. So actually we have a good theorem called uh, chomsky stenberger's theorem stating that the generating function of every un ambiguous context free language is algebraic. By using this theorem, we can formally show that Q is not an, an ambiguous context free. And actually this is firstly shown by Peter Sen, but in 1994, he showed that the generating function of the set of primitive words has this form. It can be represented by using our Mabius function, okay? And he showed that this is a non-algebraic generating function. So Q is not an, an ambiguous context free language. Okay. So this is, is a generating functional approach. But as far as I know, for general context free languages, there is no good theory of generating functions. So I think this approach is very hard to apply to the conjecture. Also, there is more uh, formal language theoretic approach, constructing a regular language so that this condition holds. Because there, if we have some context-free language L and uh, some con regular language L, and then their intersection is always context free. So if we can construct such language L for Q, then we can show that Q is not context free. Okay. However, the monograph says that by some results of uh, Katsoni and Katsula, this approach also seems to be hopeless because they showed that for many uh, forms of regular languages, uh, their intersection with the set of primitive words is always uh, always context free. And then now there are results called Katsoni Katsura theory, which I don't explain deeper. So please see the monograph for details. Okay. And um, but we have uh, another approach, which is maybe our most simplest approach, 
like a pumping lemma like technique. Okay. But this approach is also hopeless because actually Q resists almost all known tests of context freeness, including uh, various uh, extension of classical pumping lemma. Okay. So now let's turn to the, the main topic of this talk, some quantitative approach to the primitive word conjecture. Okay. So let me first introduce the notion of density of formal languages. So here we call, we, we write delta AL as a asymptotic density of a language L, which is a defined by here, which is a limit of this fraction. So let's forget about this limit and then only consider this fraction. So the value of this fraction exactly represents the, the, the probability that the randomly chosen word of length n is in L, okay? And then take its limit. So that is a asymptotic density of a language L, okay? And then Brustel showed that if L is regular, then the, the, its density is always rational number if it exists, okay? So this factor is basically follows from the fact that the generating function of any regular language is rational, pretty fact, okay? So for regular languages, we have more, we have another pretty fact. So here we call a language null if its density is zero. And this fact gives a alternative characterization of non-null regular languages. A language, a regular language L is null if and only if it is dense, dense in this sense. It, it intersects with any uh, ideal language generated by any words. Here, A star W A star is called the, the ideal language generated by W, which consists of all words contains W as a subword. Okay. So basically speaking, so this fact says that two different notions of largeness, one is a major theoretic largeness, non-null, and the, another one is a topological largeness called the dense uh, equivalent for the regular case. Okay. And then I want to explain the further factor two. So the left to right direction, L is not only implies L is dense is true for any language, not necessary to be regular languages, but the converse direction is not true in general. So from left to right direction is very easy. It can be proved that by using uh, infinite, infinite monkey theorem. And maybe some participants remember that the, the in last year's CLA, I gave a talk and the main topic of my talk was uh, extension of infinite monkey theorem. Okay, I really like this theorem, which very easy to show and uh, very classical, okay. The infinite monkey theorem says that any ideal language is very large, is of density one. Okay. So now left to right direction can be shown like this. So L is not dense, means by definition there is a some word W which does not intersect with L, okay, in this sense. But so, we have this inequality because the, the complement of L contains this language so that the density of this language L is smaller than one minus uh, the density of A star W A star, which is density one by infinite monkey theorem. So the density of L is zero. So left to right direction is true for general language, but right to left is not true because we have some very simple counter example, which we call semi-dike language, which consists of all 
a consistent sequence of uh, left and right parents. Okay. This language is dense because for any broken sequence of parents, we can add left bracket and a right bracket so that it's consistent. Okay. So this language is dense, no forbidden word, but actually this language is no. Density is zero. Okay. We can formally prove that uh, this fact by using a very basic connection between the Catalan numbers and the, the, the number of semi dike words of length n. Okay. So now let's turn to a quantitative property of the set of primitive words Q. The first, I demonstrate that Q is very large. Okay. So Q is null. Con null means the, the, its complement is null. Formally, its density is one. Okay. So this is very, very easy and uh, maybe, maybe for Croa, but I give you a proof because it is simple. So we show that the complement is actually null. Okay. So because each number n has at most two square root n divisors, and if w can be the, the w is now of length n, if the w can be represented by a such form, a power of proper shorter words, then the b should be length smaller than half of n. Okay, this is very basic. So we have this upper bound for the number of uh, non-primitive words of length n. Here, sharp denotes the cardinality of these sets. And this set is exactly the set of all non-primitive words of length n, okay? And here, the two square root n represents the, the possibility of divisors, upper bound of divisors, and the right hand side represents the upper uh, bound of the possibility of choice of this word V, okay? So simple calculation gives us the fact that the complement of Q is nil, okay? Because uh, this fraction tends to zero, okay? So recall that we consider the case, the alphabet consists of two letters A and B, so that this uh, denominator is uh, two to the n is power, okay? Okay, so anyway, this fact is very simple and uh, maybe folklore, but I don't found any literature which, which pointed out this fact explicitly. Anyway, so this fact actually gives us a rough intuition that why Q fulfills various extensions of pumping lemma-like test of context freeness, okay? because any pumping sequence cannot escape from Q. So now recall that the, the, this is uh, exactly the statement of classical pumping lemma, okay? If L is context free, there is some uh, length P called the pumping length. And then if L contains a sufficiently large, sufficiently long word U, which is longer than P, can be factorized as the W, X, Y, Z, which W and Y are pumping part. And we can pump this part arbitrarily many times, preserving membershipness of L. Okay, so if L contains U and the U has some factorization of this form, and then we can pump it. And then if some N, if the W, N, X, Y, N, Z, is in the outside of L, we can conclude that by using pumping lemma, L is not context free, okay? L is not context free. So this is how pumping lemma like technique works. But now, how about Q? Because Q is very large. It contains almost all words. So any pumping sequence 
basically you cannot escape from Q, okay? Because it is very large. So this is a very rough, but good intuition why the, 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 the pumping lemma-like technique doesn't work for uh, the, this conjecture, okay? Sorry. Okay, so now I, I want to introduce uh, another theorem, which is more hard to show. Every regular subset of Q is actually very small, null. So this theorem states that basically while Q, while Q is very large, but every regular subset of Q is null. So intuitively, this means that there is no good, good lower approximation of Q by regular languages. We cannot have uh, any good approximation from lower, okay? So, I mean, Q has very complex shape from the viewpoint of regular languages. And then proof of this theorem uses our basic semigroup theory, including uh, Green's relations and uh, Green's theorem. And I think not so much participants are familiar with uh, semigroup theory, but I think, okay, I think I have a time, enough time. So I give a quick introduction to semigroup theory and uh, I want to explain the proof, proof sketch of this theorem. Okay, now we consider a monoid M. M is not necessary to be finite. Infinite monoid is okay. So for monoid M, we can define Green's four relations, J, L, R, and H, as like this. And all of these relations can be defined by using the notion of ideals. The element of M, A, and B are equivalent with respect to J relation if and only if, if the, the, the ideals generated by A and B are equal. This is the definition of the J relation. And the L relation is the, defined by using the left ideal and uh, it's, it's dual R and H is uh, the, the join of the relation L and R, okay? So basically we can, we can interpret the, this relation by using uh, some graph theoretical intuition because, so consider the J relation, okay? A and B are equivalent with respect to J if and only if there are four elements, X, Y, X prime, Y prime, such that X, A, Y equals to B and X prime, B, Y prime equals to A, which can be interpreted as uh, A and B are mutually reachable, okay? By, by multiplying, by both sides multiplying uh, by other elements. So A and B belong to the same strongly connected component in the Cayley graph of N. This is the notion of uh, J relation, okay? So L can be interpreted as the, some left reachability relation, okay? And R as a light reachability relation, okay? So now the, the statement of Green's theorem is follows. Let M be a monoid and A be its element. Then the here HA uh, denotes the, 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 the equivalent class of A with respect to H relation, okay? And the theorem states that HA contains some idempotent element if and only if it is actually a subgroup of M and whose identity element is E. That's idempotent, okay? Hmm. Okay, so this is Green's theorem and Green's relations. Can I ask so a question? Of course. 
by saying a subgroup of M, do you mean like a submonoid because M? Uh, uh, no, no. So here, subgroup means that subset of M, which every element has an inverse element. So the, the unit element not necessary to be coincide with the M's identity, right? Okay. Uh, are you satisfied? Uh, probably. Be because maybe, uh, maybe it's a very stupid question because I thought in monoid we cannot necessarily take the inverse. Uh, so in general, monoid has no inverse element in general. Okay. Monoid plus inverse element is just a group, but yes, uh, no, okay. So anyway, so right to left direction of Green theorem is trivial because if HA is a group, then it surely contains the identity, uh, identity element, okay? And it is because identity, so it is also idempotent. So right to left uh, direction is trivial, but left to right is non-trivial, and which is actually uh, what's green proved. Okay. S sorry, just uh, to ask Sergey's question. So you mean it really is a subgroup rather than a submonoid? Would you? Ah, uh, okay. It's really a subgroup. That's my answer. Is, sorry, could you repeat that? Because, can you give it just a uh, example oh. of uh, so, you Ser voice. Sergey, your connection is uh, is uh, bad. Um, Sergey, your, your connection is bad. Maybe you could write it in the chat window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, chat is more preferable. because I have better reading skill than listening skill. So. Maybe, a small, maybe example. a small example. Uh, I cannot use white words, so. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, okay, anyway. Um, uh, okay, the proof actually contains uh, the how to use green theorem. So maybe the if I explain the proof, maybe yeah. he can grasp some intuition. So yeah, maybe you, you can go on and if, yeah, if yeah. it's unclear, we can come okay. back later. Anyway, so this is our statement of green theorem. Okay, so now let me show, let me demonstrate how to prove this theorem, okay. So now we assume let L be a regular language with a positive density, okay? And then let eta be the natural morphism from A star to the discursion monoid called syntactic monoid of L. And here, this relation, tilde L, is called the syntactic congruence and the defined like this. The two words U and V are equivalent on this congruence if and only if which these are the L cannot distinguish these two words U and V by concatenating uh, other words. Okay, this is a concept of the syntactic congruence. And this is actually a congruence, so we can take the quotient. Okay. The the classical Mahir Nero the CLM states that the, the L is regular if and only if this is a finite monoid. And then let S be uh, the syntactic image of the language L, okay? So now we consider this situation, okay? So the first claim, I didn't, I don't give a proof detail, is that uh, the, the, the assumption that L is positive density and uh, the syntactic monoid is finite, so we can conclude from this assumption, we can conclude that S contains our J minimal element T. Here, this ordering J order is defined like this. A is smaller than B if it's generated, generated uh, ideal is smaller than B's, B's. 
Okay. So claim one can be shown by using infinite monkey theorem, but I omit the proof detail. Okay. So the second claim is that T is J minimal in price. This is rather trivial. Uh, for any n t, n is power of t is equal to t with respect to j relation. So we have the j equivalence class t here, blue rectangle, and it contains for any n t n. Okay. And the claim three is a bit semi-group theoretic claim. Uh, the syntactic monoid is finite and uh, T and the TN are equivalent with J relation. In price, actually these are H equivalent. So the, the equivalent class of, H equivalent class of T is exactly the J equivalent class of T. Okay. And then the, the last claim is that the, this is a very standard claim, very standard argument in finite semigroup theory that that the 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 finiteness of the syntactic monoid implies for some k the k power of t is idempotent. Okay, so we can apply Green's theorem so that. HT is a group with the identity element TK. So this is the exactly subgroup of the syntactic monoid of L with the identity TK. So now consider the non-empty world from the inverse image of T, okay? Because T is in the syntactic image of S whose inverse W is also in L. Okay, and then consider the non-primitive world, k plus one powers of w, and then calculate its syntactic image. Because eta is a morphism, we have following equation, this equation. And then the image of w is exactly t, so we have the k plus one powers of t. And, but this is exactly the, the tk multiply t, which TK is the identity element. So actually we have T and it is in S. Thus the non-primitive word WK plus one is in L. So this is a sketch of the proof. Okay. Okay, so I have a few minutes left. So I'd like to conclude my talk with few open problems. Okay, so in this talk, we gave a um, um, brief introduction to the primitive world conjecture, uh, including some survey and uh, some brief intuition why this problem is harder to solve. And we also describe a special two quantitative properties of Q. It is very large, but any regular subset is very small. So Q has very special form special shape. And uh, this, the third item is just uh, my opinion, maybe, maybe false, maybe false. I, I think for tackling this conjecture, a study of the theory of large context free languages is important. So the, this is uh, the last slide, three open problems. Uh, maybe it is better to discuss these problems in open program session, I think. Okay, th thank you very much, Ryoma. That's all, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Hi. Perhaps everybody can unmute and give a round of applause. I will start. <laughs> I know these things are a bit awkward, but but so are the, we have time for a few questions. <clears throat> are, are there questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, we have a few. Oh, I see. We have a few questions. Uh, so is that Olivier? 
Uh, no. Uh, oh. you know, yes, I speak. It's, uh, yes. I am the guy who, speak, who is speaking. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so. Um, so my question is, so you, so you, you know that the, asymptotically, uh, um, there is almost the same number of elements in Q and in the, 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 the language, uh, uh, the free language with two later. Um, do, do you know more precisely what is the asymptotic of number of, in, in, uh, of uh, what is the asymptotic of Q? So Q, Q is, uh, sorry, Bruce, uh, so, so pre, uh, uh, yes. So you, you, you have this expression. Okay. So, yes, so, uh, but. Can you, 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 are, you are able to analyze this expression? Because it, it seems that if we use Dirichlet series, it's, it's all, it could be quite easy to understand what is uh, the meaning of this expression. It's just okay. uh, another person. Mm -hmm. I only know a uh, laugh asymptotic formation of this generating function because, uh, because it is actually so maybe it tends to, uh, maybe it can be upper bounded by the properly upper bounded by uh, the the some exponential function, but I, I don't know precise asymptotic uh, formula of this language. I okay. only know uh, this equation, and I only know the its density is zero. Okay. Yes, uh, as Marta Pépin said, it's it just, okay, you, you can express, uh, you have a, a solution of one divided by one minus two z is equal to some product of, uh, some uh, Adama product of, of, uh, of Q uh, for uh, of both sides. Okay, so, so it, it is easy to understand this. Uh, so this equation is actually not very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But the question is. Uh, <laughs> question is. What what is the asymptotic uh, of this precisely? I think it's easy. Uh, okay. It may be easy, but the yeah. answer is I, I don't know. I okay. don't know precise uh, asymptotic formula. Okay, because we can use Melin transform to 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 get something about this. Uh, Melin transform maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. But I think Thank question. But they could be. It could be interesting to have uh, the, uh, more terms in the in the asymptotic expansion because uh, okay it's two to the n this is uh, the, the dominant part but after uh, it could be useful to understand what is uh, the next uh, next term in the expansion so uh, it's clearly it's two to the n times something one plus something but I don't know what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two to the any minus something. One minus something, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Martin is answering your question right now in the chat. Yes. But can I have a remark about Olivia's question, maybe? Yeah, and uh, because you told uh, earlier that um, mm -hmm. it's not possible to approach an um, so we can only approach an ambiguous context three grammars with generating functions. And uh, so, that's why uh, with generating functions, with generating functions, we can only approach unambiguous context free grammars. Uh, but, but at the same time, we can uh, enumerate uh, words from uh, ambiguous grammars but uh, up to multiplicity that's correct so then if a word has several multiplicities we could uh, potentially use uh, inclusion exclusion methods to enumerate uh, words only one but i mean it's just no... uh, it's not a rigorous no. remark but uh, no but uh, i don't understand exactly but we, we our conjecture is that there is no grammar which generates this language 
right? So no, yeah, uh, but you're right. But um, yeah, it's it's difficult to to say how many multiplicities uh, are there for duration. Uh, but but work, uh, yes, but yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So the the yes, we can from the ambiguous grammar we can calculate generating function, and but it does not count the number of words. It does count, it do count the number of parsing trees. So was with multiplicity, yes. So um, um, ambiguous means there is uh, uh, many parsing tree for a single word, okay? The number of different parsing tree is exactly the multiplicity of word. Uh, it's okay. But the potential yes. way to see that. Okay, just just a comment that we're running close to the start of the next talk, so um, <clears throat> so maybe we should. So I mean, you you know, you continue. Ah, I have an idea. So <laughs> you can continue this discussion over the Discord server, the Discord server chat. Maybe that's the best way to continue it. Uh, and to give and, uh, to give time. Sorry. Um, no. no? Y yes. Can I attend open program session tomorrow? Yes, of course, of course. Because today's so, <laughs> open program session is too too late from Japan. It's, so. it's very late. Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's too late. So <laughs> maybe I will attend the tomorrow's yeah, open program session. I will send us some slide. Yeah, that's a, that would be great. Later. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, thank you again for this very interesting talk. And yeah, and you can continue the conversation. Okay, so I'm gonna stop recording now.